pandemic has brought into sharp focus the bravery, dedication, and sacrifice of our health workers, our main frontliners in our fight against COVID-19. For our webinar today, we will take a look at our uh, healthcare workers who are our main and primary movers in the delivery of essential healthcare services with or without a pandemic. We'll tackle important issues such as their limited supply in certain areas of the country, the additional risks that they face given new and emerging infectious diseases, the possible ways by which we can promote their well-being, as well as measures that we can undertake to better incentivize them so they will be better motivated to locate in underserved areas and to work and to remain in the country. So at this point, I'd like to call on our president, Dr. Celia Reyes, for her opening remarks. Mom Cell? Thank you, Sheila. Uh, good afternoon to our colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, and the media. Mom Cell, Welcome. please uh, turn on your microphone, please. It is. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. So, again, good afternoon to our colleagues from the government, academe, uh, civil society, and the media. We'd like to welcome you to the weekly webinar of PIDS. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us times we rely on their expertise, not only in managing our health problems, but also in looking for an antidote that will stop the spread of the disease. With health workers as frontliners during this health crisis, we have seen our stakeholders express their gratitude for their services. A more important lesson during this pandemic is that it has reminded us to look into the welfare of our health workers. In fact, a recent PIDS study on COVID-19 showed that uh, one of the challenges in increasing our health system capacity would be the limited supply of our health workers. To address this, the government, through the Department of Health, has released Department Memorandum uh, number 2020-0153 for the emergency hiring of health personnel in select hospitals and other health facilities to expand the country's response to the COVID-19 health emergency. According to the memorandum, these health personnel will be hired as contract of service and will be deployed in DOH-designated COVID-19 referral hospitals, temporary treatment and monitoring facilities, DOH-designated diagnostic facilities, public hospitals handling COVID-19 patients, and private hospitals duly designated by the DOH to handle COVID-19 cases. But this is just for COVID-19. How about the needed human resources for health in the country outside of COVID-19? The Department of Health in its Philippine National Objectives for Health covering the period 2017 to 2020 reported that human resources for health 2016. The data show that only two regions, namely NCR, National Capital Region, and the Cordillera Administrative Region, have sufficient rural health units or health center physicians, and only seven regions have enough rural health midwives such as CAR, Ilocos, Cagayan Valley, Mim Maropa, West, Northern Mindanao, and Caraga. Only three regions, which include NCR, Ilocos, and Caraga, have adequate number of public health dentists. What is most alarming is that none of the regions have adequate public health nurses with permanent positions to cover the entire population. According to the UH report, this translates to a shortage of 2,013 physicians in rural health units or health centers 
4,467 public health nurses, almost 4,000 rural health midwives, and 148 public health dentists appointed in a permanent position. The scarcity of health workers is most noticeable in Arm, Davao, Sambuanga Peninsula, and Calabar Zone. This afternoon, uh, Dr. Michael Abrigo, a senior research fellow at PIDS, will present the paper he co-authored with former research associate Ms. Danica Ortiz, which examined the spatial distribution of healthcare workers across the country. Based on the results, less than 25% of cities and municipalities have health human resource density. Mamsel, you froze. Uh, we are experiencing some technical uh, difficulties uh, with the uh, inter internet connection of uh, Mamselia. Um, sorry, but th these are things beyond our control. Okay, Mamsel will uh, rejoin us later as soon as he is she is able to to log in. But um, before we before we continue with the Mamsel's uh, opening remarks, let me just remind you of some important house house rules. Um, during our open forum, um, for you to be able to to join our open forum, if you have questions if, or if you have comments, we um, invite you. We would like to um, inform you to put your to type your name and your um, affiliation as well as your comment or your question by using the chat box. And I will call you during the open forum. Um, in addition to that, uh, for those of for those of you who are uh, viewing this uh, webinar through our Facebook account, just use the comment box of um, of, uh, of Facebook. And uh, your your question or your comment will be um, relayed to our audience during the open forum. Okay. Mamsel is not in yet. Um, another reminder, as I've mentioned, we are uh, broadcasting this live. And during the open forum, for those of you who would like to ask a question or, or a comment or would like to raise a comment, Please enable your videos as much as possible so the audience can see who you are. Okay. Is Mamsel back? Okay, she is not back yet. Uh, we will um, ask her to um, complete her, her um, opening remarks later. So at this point, let me um, introduce to you, perhaps we can already proceed to the research presentation. So let me introduce to all of you the, the authors of our study. The main author is, um, our main author is Dr. Michael Abrigo. Dr. Abrigo is a senior research fellow at S. Okay. Please, a gentle reminder to please mute your microphones. So, okay, going back to the profile of uh, Dr. Abrigo, he is a research fellow at PIDS where he works on population health and nutrition policy issues. Dr. Abrigo uh, to the Philippines. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the East West Center in Honolulu and he obtained his in economics from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Again, a gentle reminder to everyone to please meet your microphones to avoid unnecessary noises uh, during your webinar. 
Thank you very much. Now let me uh, turn to Dr. Abrigo's uh, co-author. Her name is Dani Cortis. Dani Cortis used to be um, a, senior, a supervising research specialist at PIDS where she uh, conducted uh, studies on health. She is currently affiliated with the House of Representatives. Okay, so let us hear now the presentation of uh, Dr. Mike Abrigo. Uh, thank you so much, Sheila. Uh, this is my uh, second webinar, and hindi pa rin ako sanay uh, to present uh, results of our research na hindi ko kaharap yung mga usap ko. So bear with me. Also bear with my hair if you're seeing my video kasi wala pa yung barbershop and this is what it is. So uh, first I want to thank uh, Danica Ortiz, who's, who was, uh, as mentioned by Sheila, a research associate at PIDS, who worked with me um, in this uh, paper. Uh, Mamsel is back. Okay. Um, when we were starting with this uh, research project, we were not really, we started uh, not having this research in mind. Our original design namin was to have a projection of um, healthy human resources for the Philippines. And during that time, when we were thinking about this project, uh, we felt that that was what was needed at that time. We, we, uh, DOH has this, um, was working on this project about um, how many re uh, human resources do we need? And we felt that we can contribute uh, to that discussion. But while we were doing, we were poking the data uh, during that time, we realized that it appears that, and this is uh, jumping the gun, uh, that we, it appears that we have, many health human resources in the Philippines. And it's not the number that is really the issue, but the distribution, and that piqued our curiosity. What do we really know about the health workers in the Philippines? Um, nasan ba sila? Uh, ano yung edad nila? Uh, puro ba sila babae? Puro ba sila lalaki? And if you go to the next slide, please, uh, when you look at the literature, and if you ask, what do we really know about healthcare workers around the world? It appears that we, we don't really know much. So most of the studies are in developed countries. So US, uh, Europe, Australia, Japan. And there were very few in developing countries. For the developing countries, many of these are in South Africa, in Africa and in South America. And in terms of the, man of the cadres that were studied, um, much of those, uh, much of the cadres that were studied focused on, ano, on physicians. Uh, and there were not really much talk about the other cadres, about nurses, midwives, optometrists, opticians, uh, physiotherapists. And that, is, and that is the question, that is the void that we want to uh, fill uh, in this research. Next slide, please. So these are the research questions that we have for this paper. Uh, very simple lang siya and very straightforward. First, uh, we want to characterize the supply of healthcare workers in the Philippines. Gano ba karami sila? Saan ba sila nakatira? Puro, babae ba sila? Um, uh, Saan sila nagtatrabaho? Ano klase mga, mga human resource sila? Health human resource. And then second, we want to analyze uh, the loc locational factors that influence the decision of healthcare workers. Because... Uh, we know that there is a reason bakit sila nan, if, they're, if they are uh, living in, if they're originally from, uh, for example, Sambales and they are now working in, in NCR, why are they in NCR? What's in NCR? Or if they're not in NCR, why are they not in NCR? Why are, why are they here, essentially? So next slide, please. Um, so... Just in case uh, mag-log out kayo dito sa seminar, these are the main results para upfront makuha nyo na yung uh, main storylines. One is that um, the health human resource in, uh, density, based on density, there appears to be sufficient, sufficient for the Philippines if you look at the national figures. And this is nothing new. Uh, we've heard about this before. And when we but when we disaggregate this into finer, finer um aggregations like municipalities, cities, uh, dun tayo problema. So at the national level, if we look at just the Philippines as a whole, 
walang masyadong, walang, parang walang problema kasi we have enough based on some thresholds. But when we look at municipalities and cities, dun na yung disparity. And what we found is that uh, uh, less than a quarter, less than 25% of cities and municipalities have the ideal density proposed by WHO. So less than 45 um, health workers per 10,000 population. Um, and over time, we, based on data, there is an increase in geographic dis, uh, concentration of this HHS, HHR uh, supply in the Philippines from 1990. And finally, uh, when we look at uh, the reasons why they are there, why uh, they locate where they practice where they are, uh, we found that um, improving um, ethnic diversity among health human resources appeared to not improve the supply of HHRs and LGUs with higher ethnic concentration, higher poverty rates, which is contrary to what we usually think or what was found in, in some literature. Um, ang, isa pang, ang isa pang contribution na itong paper na to, itong research na to, is that in previous research in the Philippines, uh, first, the data that they use are mainly based on, on, the, on the flow flow of health human resource in the Philippines. So usually number of board passers, number of um, new migrant workers, and these are good data. And they are able to build, from, from the flow data, they are able to build uh, some estimate of the stock. But here we are using, I guess, uh, better data by using uh, census. So in, in, uh, compared to the uh, flow estimate from the board passers, Ang alam kasi na, hindi lahat kasi ng board passers ay actually nag work as health human resource. They, they have the certification, they have the qualifications, but they are not necessarily employed as health workers. And that's one beauty of using the census. And another contribution of this paper um, is that uh, when we analyze yung reasons kung bakit kung bakit nasa par isang particular na lugar yung isang uh, health uh, worker, we are looking at uh, revealed preferences and uh, based sa action nila instead of their stated preferences. For the many studies that I found in the Philippines, uh, much of the questions on identifying ano ba yung reasons ng mga workers, mga health workers, kung bakit sila sa particular na lugar, is because uh, the researcher asked the person, bakit ka nagtatabaho dito? Ano yung mga dahilan mo? Which could mask, which has some beauty, but could mask some of the some of the finer details of the reasons kung bakit nag-locate yung mga health workers where they are. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, okay. So the paper is based on, the, uh, this presentation is based on this paper. Uh, you can download it uh, through these links. Next slide. This is the outline of my presentation this afternoon. So. First, I would go over the supply of health human resources in the Philippines. I would go over the flow, go over, go over the stock. Uh, ano ba yung uh, uh, demographic characteristics ng mga healthcare workers natin? And then I'll go over the uh, analysis of the location decision of the healthcare workers, focusing on just three. So I'd look, we looked into uh, physicians, nurses, and midwives. And finally, ano ba yung implications nito for policy? Next slide, please. So first question, um, how many health human, health human resource enter the system? How many leave per year? Uh, next slide. Okay. So this graph shows the number of board passers by health professions by year for the Philippines uh, five year, every five years from, two, from 2000 to 2015. So we have uh, we have these different uh, professions: so medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, nutritionist, dietitians, optometry, physical therapy, nursing, and midwifery. So among these cadres, nurses comprise the largest number of new healthcare professionals annually among the different cadres uh, presented here. So in 2000, in year 2000, about 4,600 among the 9,300 applicants passed the board exam for nursing. So this has ballooned to about 67,000 out of 175,000 applicants in, tw in 2010 before bumaba siya ng konti to 
18,800 tasers in 2015. The country also produces a substantial number of physicians, uh, pharmacists, and midwifery professionals in terms of number of ward tasers. So particularly in more recent years, so papataas yung trend niya from 2000 to 2015. Among physicians, for example, the number of board pastors in medicine increased from about 1,900 in 2000, in year 2000, to 5,500 in 2015. So this is particularly, uh, partly due to the increase in the number of applicants between 2000 and 2015, uh, which almost doubled from about 6,800, uh, which almost doubled to about uh, almost 7,000 in 2015 from only about 3,500 in 2000. And partly then due to the increase in passing rate, which has grown from 80% um, uh, from 52% in 2000 to 80% uh, in 2015. So the number of, so meron tayong pharmacy midwifery professional board passers then on the other hand also increased during this period. Uh, so among the cadres that you can see here, only dentists and physical therapists have posted declines in the number of board passers over the past uh, 15 years. So in 2000, in year 2000, about uh, 1,300 dentists and 2,400 physical therapists passed the board exams. That was in more recent years, in 2015, it has declined to 700 for dentists, uh, if we look at the written exam only, and then 1,000 physical therapists in 2015. Okay, so next slide, please. So, yung previous na slide, uh, that is the entry of new professionals. Uh, this slide naman tells you yung exit, uh, one form of exit, and that is through international migration. Um, scale natin siya by the number of new hire, uh, Niskil lang siya by the number of new board passers for that year. So ibig sabihin, pag more than, pag more than 100 siya, ibig sabihin mas malaki yung nag-migrate uh, na new hire for that year relative to the number of new board passers for that year. And for the most part, uh, increasing siya. So that is some, that is sort of uh, some uh, worrisome, for, especially for medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, uh, nutritionist, dietitians, uh, optometry, physical therapist. Uh, ang pababa lang ay yung nursing kasi uh, dumadami kasi yung, yung uh, dumadami yung pumapasa ng nursing over the years. Uh, what's also worrisome is that for optometry and physical therapy, at least for 2015, mas marami yung nag-migrate kaysa dun sa bagong pumasok na uh, professionals for that professionals. So next slide, please. So ang next up and uh, so given this flow and exit, how many health human resources in total do we have? And previously, uh, uh, the previous estimates that we have are based on board passers. Uh, this time around, I am using census data from PSA to look at the number and the, and the characteristics of the health human resource. Uh, next slide, please. Pero before tayo pumunta doon, I want to segue. Uh, if we are counting the number of health human resources in the Philippines, is there an ideal number of HHR? And... Some, some groups, some uh, international organizations have estimated it uh, for many countries. So, and their estimates varies from 2.3 based on WHO in 2006 to 4.5, the more recent na estimate on WHO. Uh, can refer to the paper if you want to look at the details. But this is the range of their uh, suggested HHR density per thousand population. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, this table presents you the stock estimates of health human resources in the Philippines by type. So, there are physicians, dentists, pharmacists, nutrition dietitians, uh, optometrists, opticians, physiotherapists, professional nurses, pro professional midwives, uh, technicians, and nursing and midwifery technicians. Hiniwalay ko lang yung nursing and midwifery technicians kasi medyo uh, marami sila. Okay. Yung 
count naman dito is based on the number of people who do at the time the sense of sinabi nila ganito yung trabaho ko uh, pwedeng yung total number of uh, board certified na physicians ay mas malaki kaysa sa mga number na dito ang mga number na nandito ay yung lang nagsabi na during that time ito yung trabaho nila so okay over the last 25 years the talk Uh, the numbers suggest that the country has experienced robust growth in the number of some uh, HHR cadres, including physicians, uh, pharmacists, physiotherapists, professional nurses, and medical and pharmaceutical te technicians. Uh, with the stock, with the number of these uh, professionals growing faster than the 2.2% uh, annual growth uh, recorded for the general population of the Philippines between 1990 and 2015. So, lagging behind, however, our dentist. Uh, growing only at 1.8% annually over over the last 25 years. Uh, nutritionists and dietitians growing at only 0.2% annually. And optometrists and opticians uh, close to zero. But there appears to be a significant drop between 2010 and 2015, uh, between 1990 and 2010, and then a pick up uh, during 2015. For some professionals, particularly for midwives, but this is, I guess, uh, some definitional change lang. Uh, in how we define uh, midwives. Okay. So, based on this, uh, we can assess, ano ba yung, based on the inflow and outflow of workers in the Philippines and the population of the Philippines, we can calculate, ano ba yung density of this HHR per 10,000, yung kanina, 1,000 population, per dito, per 10,000 population, for these cadres uh, between 1990 and 2015. So in 2015, for every 10,000 population in the Philippines, there were 34.9 professional nurses, 8.6 healthcare technicians, 5.2 physicians, 2.7 dentists, one physiotherapist, and less than one professional midwives, nutrition dietitians, optometrists, and nutritionists. So except for dentists, nutritionists, and dietitians, optometrists, and opticians, and midwives, all the other uh, cadres uh, have increasing um, HHR density over the past 25 years. So if yung um, earlier na pinakita ko na uh, threshold for HHR density is based on three cadres. So HHR density ng combined physicians, uh, professional midwives and professional nurses. Uh, if we would use the 2.6 and 4.5 na estimates on WHO in 2000 and 2016 as bounds, uh, and if you compare that with the uh, density for the Philippines, we can say that we are closer to the newer bound of the WHO. And if we compare it with the ILO na, na 4.1 yung kanilang highest, we are above that threshold, at least at the national scale. So that said, even if um, pasado tayo or close tayo sa pasado sa threshold na yun, uh, the supply of the different cadres of healthcare workers are highly uneven when we consider their geographic distribution within the country. Here we estimated the uh, spatial disparity using Gini coefficient. The idea is that kung zero ka, zero yung Gini coefficient, uh, lahat ng HHR distribution, ng HHR density, that is proportional siya dun sa population. So parang equal distribution for population over the whole country. Uh, tapos on the other hand, kung one yung Gini coefficient, ibig sabihin nasa isang lugar lang lahat ng HHR natin sa Pilipinas. And between 1990 and 2015, we can see an increasing inequality in the spatial distribution of these uh, of these different categories of healthcare workers that we consider in this uh, report. The, sp uh, the spatial Gini coefficient is... Uh, uh, is highest among physicians, so yung Gini index niya is 84, 0.84, dentists, 0.79, uh, medical and pharmaceutical technicians, pharmacists, physiotherapists, and professional nurses. So some of the cadres that, ha that have experienced the greatest degree of polarization over the past 25 years uh, include uh, physiotherapists, so additional 28 percentage points dun sa kanyang Gini Nutritionists and dietitians plus 25 percentage points sa kanyang Gini coefficient, pharmacists plus 23 percentage points, and medical and pharmaceutical technicians uh, plus 21 percentage points. 
uh, um, over this period, yung physicians, sa simula pa lang, mataas na yung kanyang uh, gene coefficient at about uh, 0.7 to 1990. Next slide, please. So, who are the health workers? Ano ba yung mga characteristics ng mga health care workers natin? Next slide. So, first we look at HHR uh, distribution by sex. Uh, from this graph, we can see that the local supply of HHR is female-dominated, uh, except for physicians and physiotherapists in the 1990s. So, more equal yung physicians in the 1990s, and mas konti yung babae sa physiotherapists during the 1990s. But in more recent years, uh, across the board, mas maraming babae sa ating uh, health human resource. Next slide, please. Uh, for much of the cadres, uh, there is increasing feminization. You can see it among physicians, dentists, physiotherapists, uh, health associates, and technicians. And for some, next slide, please. And for some, even if it's female-dominated originally in, in the 1990s, in 2015, made a version for uh, Next slide, please. So here naman, we look at the uh, distribution by age. So across the board, if you look at physicians, dentists, pharmacists, physiotherapists, nurses, and yung iba pinagsama-sama ko na, generally the HHR population in the Philippines is generally young. So yung kanilang for example, the median age among physicians and dietitian, uh, dietitians was 42. Uh, so, mga 30s siya in 2015. Oh, no, 40s. So, 40s, 30s siya uh, between 1990 and 2015. Next slide, please. That said, uh, even if the health human resource population is young, maybe considered young, uh, some cadres are aging. If you look at the age distribution profile, so merong shift towards the left, so papatanda. And this is very apparent for dentists. And But for some, like nurses and pharmacists, uh, it remains na bata pa rin yung population yung mga health human resources natin. Next slide, please. Uh, ito naman, uh, by marital status, largely married yung mga health human resources natin except for pharmacists, uh, physiotherapists, and nurses. And to, to a large degree, this may be uh, conditioned, sa age, conditioned by the age distribution of the healthcare workers. So, mga bata kasi itong mga ito, kalorihan, yeah, hindi pa lang kapag-asawa. But uh, as you can see from the other uh, cadres, uh, mas maraming mas maraming may asawa na kasi mas matanda yung age distribution no country na yun. Uh, next slide, please. Dito naman, uh, we are looking at the distribution by ethnolinguistic minority status. By ethnolinguistic minority, what we mean is that uh, there is ano, less than 1 million uh, population na nagsasalita nung no language na yun based sa census. So over the past uh, 20 years, between 1990 and the 2010 census, we can see an improving uh, inclusion, representation among ethnolinguistic minority, among health human resources in the Philippines. But uh, if I go to the next slide, if you go to the next slide, you can see that if you compare it to the general population, although there is an increasing trend towards uh, greater representation, uh, yung share ng ethnolinguistic minority among HHRs are actually less compared to the national average for the general population. So it's, it's improving, but hindi tayo umabot dun sa uh, sana uh, same representation as the general population. Next slide, please. Uh, this one naman tells us about the region of residence. Mamaya, we'd go deeper into municipalities and cities. Pero in terms of region, largely, yung mga healthy human resources natin, except for midwives and technicians, they live in Mega Manila. 
Uh, and it has been the case uh, for the past 25 years. And for the most part, hindi nag-move yung share ng Mega Manila. That includes NCR, uh, Palabar, Solim, Region 3, dun sa share of health human resources in the Philippines. Next slide. So ito na yung, I guess, more exciting uh, part. So where are the health workers? So alam natin saan sila nakatira, but it's not necessarily na doon sila nakatira, doon din sila nakatrabaho. Uh, for example, I have this cousin who, who lives in Sambales, pero every week kung punta siya na Manila to work here. So next please. So this is the... Health Human Resource composite ng uh, composed of physicians, nurses, and midwives na ginagamit ng WHO and ILO to compute the density uh, by municipality, city of residence, uh, city of residence 2015. Uh, yung inset dun sa taas na blue, that is uh, NCR. Yung color coding natin, as you go from yellow sa gitna to red, ibig sabihin papakliit yung density. And as you go from yellow to blue, uh, papataas yung issue share density. And gusto natin, yung buong Pilipinas, nandun sa taas, nasa blue. Ibig sabihin, we have more uh, health human resources per person across the board. But here you can see that, uh, largely, yung mga kulay blue natin, yung mga parts ng mga munisip munisipyo at mga city, they are north, ibig sabihin, uh, north na geographically, so Luzon, and north economically, north, ibig sabihin, uh, mas mayayaman ng mga lugar. So you can see yung mga um, city centers, yung mga, uh, ang tawag dito, mga capital ng mga probinsya, and even yung, I'm not sure if you can see it here, uh, there's this small blue dot sa may bandang palolete because there's a school there. Okay, next slide please. So when we decide, we can also disaggregate it by cadre. So we have physicians, professional nurses, and midwives. Uh, ganun pa rin yung system. Pag pa blue, pataas yung density. Pag pa red, pa kaunte. And for um, for the physicians, makita mo yung blue karamihan dun sa mga mayayaman ng mga lugar. So NCR, mga regional centers, mga capital. Uh, yung professional nurses is blue almost everywhere except for many parts, many parts of Mindanao. And for professional midwives, it's red. So I'm not sure if this is just definitional change sa ating occupational classification or it's because uh, talagang red siya. Okay, next slide. So kung ganun yung picture, so natin, bakit sila nandun? Anong meron doon? And kanina na-discuss, na, na, na-mention ko about the economy, but there could be other reasons why they are there. Uh, in the literature, they are saying that uh, many of these uh, health professionals, uh, usually kung saan sila nag-aral, malapit lang doon sila nagtatrabaho. Or halimbawa, kung meron silang um, rural background, ibig sabihin, uh, tumira sila sa isang rural place before they studied uh, yung profession nila or meron silang asawa, anak, kaibigan na taga doon or they visited that place. So meron affinity with, uh, sa rural area kaya sila nag-locate sa rural area. Uh, ang tanong, do we have that same observations when we look at uh, Philippine data? Next slide please. So in this study, we use a discrete choice location model. So uh, usually, dalawa yung, dalawa yung ginagamit na model. One is stated preference. Tinatanong nila yung tao, uh, sa, gusto, mo bang tumira, gusto mo bang magtrabaho dito? Bakit ka magtatrabaho dito? Or around that. So tatanong yung tao, bakit ganun yung decision nila? Uh, sa ginawa natin, uh, inobserve natin kung nasaan sila. So... Um, uh, inobserve natin ano yung actual na decision nila. So, revealed preference. Tapos, pag nakita natin na nandito sila, gano'n sila karami dyan, ano yung characteristics ng area na yun? So, this is based on a random utility framework na ang I main idea is that a person, in this case, a human, health human resource, will choose to work where their expected net benefit may be highest. So, it depends pa paano ba nila in-order yung mga bagay-bagay. Because some people would, some people would prefer yung 
uh, malapit sa kainan, maraming restaurants, or even malapit sa trabaho, so may hospital, or pwedeng malapit sa school kung meron silang mga anak. So pwedeng iba-iba yung, yung uh, ordering yun, but that's the idea na in-order natin yung mga location kung saan tayo yung trabaho, tapos mamimili tayo, saan tayo pinakamasaya, essentially. So we estimated this using a binomial regression model, and we have separate estimates by uh, cadre. So we have separate estimates for positions, nurses, and midwives, and by demographic characteristics of these uh, cadres. So by sex, marital status, uh, ethno-linguistic group, and age. Uh, because yung una, uh, baka iba yung preference set ng mga different cadres. At also, baka iba yung preference ng babae sa lalaki, ng asawa sa wala, sa bata, sa matanda. Next slide. Okay, so yung idea essentially nung binagawa natin is, is to look at una, how many HHR are working in a particular area and then looking at what their specific characteristics may be found there to explain uh, kung bakit ganun kadami yung mga uh, workers na nandun. So to be able to do this, we use the census data to get the, su the supply of healthy human resource by, by uh, area. And then for the economy, we have different indicators. So we included uh, controls for poverty rate, per capita LGU income, so nightlight luminosity, so satellite data. Uh, yung uh, nightlight luminosity is, sometimes, is often used as a measure of economic activity. So the idea, pag mas maliwanag yung area na yun, mas maraming economic activity. Um, we also controlled for amenities. So kung city ba siya, yung lugar na yon, meron bang hospital, meron bang landline, kasi baka, pref, baka may mga taong preferred na um, madaling, madaling yung communication. Uh, meron bang college doon? Meron bang tertiary education facility? And then we also controlled for ethnolinguistic concentration. Ang idea is to have that uh, Later, later sa discussion, kung ikaw ba ay ethnolinguistic minority, meron ka ba affinity sa isang lugar na mataas yung ethnolinguistic concentration? Okay, next slide. And so yung tables, they are in the report, you are free to download and check. But isasummarize ko na lang dito kasi marami yung tables at, at malalaki. So una, uh, where are the HHRs? Uh, we found that they are more likely, likely to work in areas with hospitals, uh, with landline network. So uh, they're likely to be found in cities and in areas with greater economic activity, especially for nurses and midwives. Uh, they are li less likely to work in areas with um, higher economic, uh, higher ethnolinguistic concentration. So mas kaunti yun nandun sa Itogon, for example. Uh, they are less likely to work in areas with higher poverty incidence, especially for, particularly for physicians and nurses. So habang papahirap yung lugar, uh, mas marami yung mahirap, uh, less likely kang makakita ng physician o ng nurses. But not for midwives. Next slide, please. So how about by characteristics? Meron bang pagkakaiba yung preference ng uh, by sex, by age, uh, and the other characteristics? So... We found that there appears to be no apparent systematic difference in preferences uh, by sex and by age group. So, lalaki at babae, pa, hindi naman nagkakaiba yung kanilang uh, preference for cities or for uh, economic activity. Uh, even among across generations, so yung bata around 20s, tsaka matatanda around 60s, tsaka yung middle, uh, uh, yung prime age, mga 30s to 50s. So, except for elderly midwives, so yung mga midwives natin na uh, age 60 plus, mga seniors na midwives, uh, based on our estimates, they are less likely to be found in richer LGUs. So, nandun sila sa general, uh, generally mas may hirap na mga lugar. And they, although they are more likely to work in cities, which sounds uh, contradictory, pero yung model kasi natin, they are adjusting for these characteristics. So, given na cities siya, pero mas mayaman yung isang LJU, uh, less likely siya nandun. Or given the same na, na income ng LJU, pero city yung isa, more likely nandun siya sa city. So ganun siya pwedeng i-interpret. Next slide, please. 
So by marital status, um, although in general physicians are more likely to work, lahat ng physicians are more likely to work in cities and in hospitals, yung mga singles, they have a slight aversion. So less likely uh, relative to ever married women to be found in cities and in hospitals. So if you are targeting yung mga DTTP, more likely yung mga singles ang willing na mapare-locate sa rural areas because meron silang slight aversion for cities and hospitals. Although, in general, they are more likely to be found there, pero compared to married uh, physicians, pwedeng mas sila yung mag-relocate to non cities at saka mga areas na walang hospital. Uh, also, single midwives are more likely to work in areas with greater economic activity relative to those ever married. So, yung pag, kung yung single na physician more likely to work dun sa, sa hindi city, yung mga single na midwives, we found that they are more likely to work in areas na, na mas marami ka ng activity. So, ibig sabihin, uh, may, may mall or to, to that effect. And for nurses naman, we found no statistical difference between the preference among single and married uh, nurses. Next slide, please. So, ito yung um, interesting. So, by ethnolinguistic minority status, we found in the literature na kung meron ka affinity dun sa area, more likely na dun ka mag-work. Uh, there is some tendency. But what we found uh, here is the reverse. So, HHRs, uh, physicians, nurses, midwives from minority background are less likely to work in areas with higher poverty rates or with higher ethnic concentration relative to non-minority HHRs, which is contradictory uh, to what we found uh, in the literature in some other countries. Next slide, please. So, uh, what does this mean for policy, to mga results natin? Next slide. First, to, su to summarize, uh, there appears to be sufficient supply of HHR at the national level. So, based sa national statistics natin, uh, yung HHR density natin for nurses, uh, nurses, physicians, and midwives closely approximates, even surpasses some of the international threshold ng HHR density. But over the past 25 years, we saw an increase in geographic polarization. Uh, towards better economically endowed locations, so mga cities, city centers, which suggests that uh, many areas in the Philippines may have limited access to healthcare professionals. As I mentioned earlier, uh, only 25% of, uh, less than 25% of LGUs, city, municipal LGUs in the Philippines, have, um, have the, uh, are above the threshold uh, proposed by WHO. Next slide, please. So, also while HHR supply in the Philippines is generally increasing, so some cadres like nutritionist, dietitians, optometrists, and opticians, and physiotherapists have declining HHR density, uh, potentially, potentially as a result of net, well, essentially as a result of net exit among these professionals, uh, potentially because of out migration, uh, migration to other countries, which may be critical in the long term. So right now, marami pa naman sila, pero in the longer term, if this continues, uh, it, it may pose some problems for us. Next slide, please. Um, going now to the location decision of healthcare professionals. So we found that uh, healthy human resources are more likely to practice in areas with greater earnings potential, uh, in areas where there are amenities, so mga cities, merong hospitals, and potentially where they are trained, so kung mga cities ito. But contrary to previous results uh, in the literature, uh, we found that HHRs from ethnolinguistic minorities are not more likely to practice in more economically depressed areas, so poor, poor regions, or in regions with higher ethnolinguistic concentration, because um, yung ating classic notion, yung ating na pag ikaw ay isang indigenous people, you are more likely to work in an IP community. And what the data says is that that's not necessarily true in the case of the Philippines. Um, next slide. So here are some thoughts that... Uh, that run through our head during that time when we were writing this. So what, what are the implications for policy? One, uh, what we 
based on the results na na, na HHRs are more likely to be in areas where there is um, high uh, higher uh, LGU income per capita. So for us, it means that uh, boosting household incomes through local economic development, uh, it appears to be uh, an essential in ensuring the economic viability of any professional practice, uh, particularly in healthcare. Uh, we're saying this because for the longest time, uh, DTTB, uh, yung ating focus in DTTB, is to just uh, augmenting or yung stopgap measure natin para mabigyan ng mga HHRs, yung mga underserved areas. And another, for us, okay, I think an another way to do it is, well, boost the economy in that area. So para yung mga tao mismo, they can afford uh, physicians, and physicians can go there. And, and we'll just... Next slide, please. Right. So the second implication uh, positive case is that uh, there may be a need to uh, re reassess common and deep-rooted beliefs on healthcare professional practice. So one is about the altruistic motives. So although, and this is from the other reports that we've seen on why do uh, particularly physicians work in rural areas because they have this altruistic motive na para sa bayan to. But I guess uh, uh, there is some space to disengage from this idea that having this altruistic motive may not be enough. And, and having this, although it's important, it may not necessarily be the most effective or most sustainable to have uh, the supply of healthcare workers uh, in the rural areas. Uh, second is that targeting minorities, uh, ethnic minorities, ethnic minorities, may be good for inclusion, but based on our results, hindi naman sila they are not more likely to go uh, to underserved areas, so sa mga areas na poor or higher ethnolinguistic, ethnolinguistic concentration. So uh, although it's good for inclusion, mas marami tayong eth ethnolinguistic minorities in, in the HHR pool, it may not necessarily be good for access among, uh, among the communities. Uh, and finally, uh, the last uh, policy implication that we thought when we were uh, doing this paper was that uh, with the apparent undersupply of HHRs in, man, in many areas across the country, it may be prudent to explore um, alternative modes of service delivery. And uh, the pandemic that we have now has ano ba, facilitated some of this uh, through technology solutions. So telemedicine, marami na tayo nakita telemedicine, most of them Facebook or even DOH. Uh, but there may also be a need not just in the technology, but also in the practice. Uh, for example, in the U.S. and in some other countries like UK, they allow uh, nurse practitioners. So these are nurses with additional certification that can uh, check uh, check patients and dispense uh, medicines, uh, prescribe medicines. So and I guess that could be explored also in the Philippines. But then, syempre, meron tayong um, kailangan gawin sa ating ano, uh, paano ba pinapractice yung mga professions nato in the Philippines. Uh, maraming salamat. That's the end of my presentation. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you for that uh, very engaging presentation. Again, uh, before we uh, uh, start our open forum, and just a reminder on our house rule for our uh, if you would like to ask a question or raise a, raise a question or um, uh, provide a comment, please just use the chat box of our uh, uh, platform. It's located at the uh, lower part of your screen. And for those who are watching us on Facebook, just type your um, comment and or your question using the comment section. Okay, so I haven't seen any um, question or comment yet in our chat box. So let me start the ball rolling by uh, asking the, the first question. Uh, Mike, um, Okay, the, the findings of your study have uh, sort of validated uh, uh, common notions in terms of uh, the interplay of uh, like push and pull, push and pull factors when it comes to making uh, decisions as to work locations. No? So, yung effect no better economic opportunities, better professional uh, um, opportunities. But but really, my uh, interest is on the uh, let's say 
if if you want if you would like to um, motivate our health workers let's say to to stay in the country or to um, work in underserved areas no so um yung non monetary incentives I, I came across this study uh, published by SIDA and uh, conducted uh, by the University of Nab- Namibia in in Africa and they were talking about certain like certain programs like um childcare support or even food allowance even a support for transportation ng mga healthcare workers also um non monetary incentives like training and career path uh, related incentives are these uh, some of the incentives i i mean have you are these uh, the types of in, uh, types of uh, non monetary in- incentives that we could probably uh, think of for health workers here in the philippines and have you um, have you encountered any let's say municipality or any local government government unit in the country that has done a, a similar initiative that's all mike uh, thank you so much Sheila. that is an um, um, interesting um, insight actually we have come across a similar study it's a meta-analysis of the different factors that influence um, location decisions of healthcare workers in developing countries and yung yung sinabi nila and what the study noted was that more than the monetary uh, incentives for many countries and for many cadres mas importante yung non-monetary and so sinabi mo uh, training uh, allowances uh, food allowances and from the study uh, what was mentioned was that uh, the most uh, important at least for the study, was that training, uh, yung, yung opportunity na to, to, to better themselves or yung future trajectory nila, to improve the, their trajectory. And for the Philippines, um, we have some studies, but uh, these are more, more qualitative. Uh, right now, we're doing a study for the Department of Health on, on uh, uh, HHR deployment program, and we're doing... Um, uh, so right now we're doing a revealed preference, but for that study, we're doing a stated preference na study so that we can tease out alin ba do sa mga factors na pwedeng lever ng government can entice uh, healthcare workers, one, to accept na mapunta sila sa mga rural areas, and second, to stay there. Uh, based on our interviews with people from the UH, um, for some professions, wala silang masyadong issue dun sa papasok, pagpasok ng mga, mga de-deploy. Ang problema nila ay paano sila mag-stay dun. Kasi, Detention, ano? Detention ang problema. Kasi uh, for many of our programs, like the Doctors of the Various program, uh, they are, yung program yun is very generous. So, ano bang SG? Hindi ko palala yung SG. But mas mataas yung SG na binibigay sa DTTB kaysa sa isang uh, ano ba, presidente na nagsisimula sa Manila. Plus, meron, meron kang mga incentives like uh, they have this partnership with, uh, with universities, or I'm not sure if universities or DAP, that they can get a master's degree uh, during the, the uh, DTTB. And they also have these uh, uh, incentives, so housing, food, travel. Yeah, yeah. Pero Mike, hindi ba we have this Magna Carta of Public Health Workers that was signed way back in 1992. So, hmm. ibig bang sabihin, hindi naging, hindi talaga uh, effectively na-implement itong Magna Carta na to. And um, I think this year, there was a call from uh, one of the senators to um, revisit this uh, this law. And uh, uh, magkaroon ng, ng um, proper uh, re- kung ano mang pwede nating magawa para mas ma- mas mapaganda pa itong Magna Carta na to. Um, I guess mas makakasagot dyan yung mga nurses kasi sila yung, oh. yung nasa news ng uh, kamakailan. But mm-hmm. also, uh, uh, ang issue lang siguro, uh, if we look na if you look this uh, look at this on a ano ba, bigger scale not just for the health professionals uh, yung palagi nating issue na meron tayong magna carta for limawa nurses we require mm-hmm. we request na sg ito yung atin pag physicians ganito pag doctors ganito tapos lahat tayo manghihingi kasi lahat naman tayo nagtatrabaho so mm-hmm. sana tayo mapupunta eventually so yun, yun lang siguro yung issue dito 
Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. We have a, um, a question from uh, one of our participants. Uh, it's uh, and the question is from Dr. Jaime Almora, who is the president of the Philippine Hospital Association. Dr. Almora, please. Hello, are you, Dr. Al Almora, are you still in the meeting? Yes, yes. Uh, yes, go ahead, sir. Good afternoon. Yes, your, uh, your data is very important to us in the Philippine Hospital Association because all the health workers, uh, we need them. And uh, indeed, uh, we have uh, shortages in uh, most of our hospitals in areas outside of the urban areas, especially the nurses uh, now. Uh, the distribution is not only geographic, but also uh, has something to do with uh, the different agencies of the government now hiring uh, nurses. For example, the Philippine National Police. For every five policemen, I think now there is one nurse for every five policemen. Uh, that's that's at least what I get in my informal survey. Whenever I see a group of five policemen, I ask them, who is among you is a nurse? And almost always there is at least one nurse or two nurses in a group of those policemen. So the, the, we know for a fact that the salary of the nurse is very high, in, uh, much, much higher in the national police than in the uh, hospitals. Also with uh, uh, the other agencies like the military, the Bureau of Fire Protection, and other agencies of the government, but uh, we do we do uh, know that uh, the, the our hospitals would have to would need to raise the salaries of our nurses in order to attract more of them. However, increasing salaries for nurses is not only for nurses. We have to increase the salaries of all our workers. Otherwise, we have a problem in our uh, uh, manpower. So, increasing salaries is also decreasing access to health care because that will bring up about uh, increase in uh, the cost of health care. Uh, this is so because uh, at present all the supplies uh, and the equipments that we use in the hospital are foreign access, are foreign based and they are priced in dollars. The only reason why we are having a relatively lower cost of healthcare in the Philippines compared to the other countries is because our manpower is still based in peso. Our equipments and our supplies, even to the list of supplies like cotton balls and, uh, and uh, surgical uh, tapes are imported. So increasing the cost, the, the salary of manpower will definitely increase uh, the cost of healthcare and the access will be affected. Um, However, we, we do need your, your data. We do, we do need your data to, to in order for us to be able to properly assess our, our situation. So my question is, where can you access your data? <laughs> <laughs> Mike? <laughs> uh, the report po is available uh, in our website, Nusalin Kanina. But for the data, uh, it's publicly available from PSA. So it's a census data. Pwede tayong mag-request through EFOI. PSA is Philippine Statistics Authority. Okay. Uh, uh, if you can post it again, I will take a picture. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, can we use it without your permission? Like uh, in our in our forums, uh, we might be sending it. Sure, po. Yung pung report is publicly available, and you can cite it. We will send you, sir, the link to the uh, study of. Uh Dr. Abrigo, together with the PowerPoint presentation. Oh, thank you. Would you have additional uh, comments or questions, sir? Dr. Almora? Uh, okay na po? Uh, okay na. Uh, we, we, this, this, this one is very important to us, and I do appreciate uh, the, the presentation. Thank you very much, sir, po, for your participation. We appreciate your presence. We have um, some comments from... Um, Dr. Hannah Mir Alpano, Hub Manager of the Social Innovation in Health Initiative. Dr. Alpano, are you there? Hello? Hello, Dr. Hannah Alpano, please. Okay, let, 
let me just read um her comments and this is uh well she's agree agreeing to uh the need for uh um more for a uh, more uh efforts you know to retain our uh uh, our healthcare workers. She said retention is more critical than recruitment nowadays. And she also commented on our Magna Carta law. She said, sadly, Magna Carta benefits are always subject to availability of funds in the LGU. Well, uh, um, with the uh, when the uh, Mandanas law, once the Mandanas law is is, is enacted, we will, uh, our LGUs will have more funds at their disposal for uh let's say um healthcare services and hopefully that law will be um will really help our um LGUs to 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 fund um healthcare services to fund better and better quality healthcare services including providing more incentives to our healthcare professionals okay our next question is from Jovic Key of uh, the Philippine Daily Inquirer. Jovic, are you there? Jovic? Jovic? Uh, yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, go ahead. Go your ahead. Question. Your question. Uh, thank you. Dr. Abigo, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, just want to ask, given your findings, is it possible for provinces to meet the DOH DOH's target for them to have one epidemiology and surveillance officer per 100,000, one contact tracer per 800, and one birth per 1,000. And another question is, uh, you my HCWs natin from the provinces don't really have a choice, so to speak, because uh, they migrate to major urban areas, either because uh, yung public hospitals in their areas don't have uh, available slots for them, or they don't get paid paid enough in the private hospitals. What do you think should be done by both the government and private sector to address this? Mike, go ahead. Please Thanks, uh, turn on your mic. Okay. Thanks, Jovic, Thanks. for your question. Uh, your first question is, is it possible for provinces to meet the DOH target? Uh, kung possibility lang yung tanong, oh naman, kasi meron naman tayong mga tao para dyan. Uh, ang tanong, uh, anong klaseng tao ba yung hinahanap natin? Uh, for epidemiology and surveillance officer, do we need an epidemiologist? Kung ganong klase na dapat epidemiologist din, baka may problema tayo. Kasi for one epidemiology surveillance officer for, for 100,000, if we have 108 million people, you need 1 million uh, officers. At yung epidemiologist dyan, definitely wala tayong ganong karami tao. Pero kung hindi naman required na epidemiologists, pwede namang nurses or other professionals or uh, para or technical technicians, kaya naman. Then another question, uh, at what cost? So magkano yung willing tayong ibigay? Uh, I remember correctly during the start of this pandemic in the Philippines, uh, naglabas yung DOH ng uh, parang naghanap sila ng volunteers. And this has led uh, quite an uproar dun sa ating mga healthcare professionals kasi tama na, uh, in my sense, um, kitabal naman yung gusto nila na if you want work, if you want us to work, then pay us yung ano ba yung required for the service that we, that we will give. Uh, for example, uh, during our some of our field works, we found that... Um, Barangay health workers, so tsaka yung mga nutrition, uh, barangay nutrition scholars, these are uh, essentially volunteers uh, doing work uh, around nutrition and health sa mga barangays. Uh, swertihan yung nakukuha nila. So merong iba na nakakuha ng 300 per month, yung iba na nakakuha ng 500, 1,000 per month for the for the activities that they do, the, the service that they do for the government, for the community. And some of these uh, workers almost uh, parang full-time job siya. Hindi na siya, um, hindi na siya parang during my free time lang. And your second question, um, uh, what could uh, the government and the private sector do to entice workers, uh, healthcare workers to stay in the provinces? Uh, mahirap siyang sagutin kasi, well, maraming rason and based on our results, uh, importante, importante yung economy. Importante na kumikita sila. 
dun sa lugar kung saan man sila nagtatrabaho. And wala, yun nga yung wala dun sa mga areas na to. And the government is doing uh, something about this through their deployment program. But the next question is, um, yung bang ginagawa ng gobyerno, is it actually improving yung distribution? Na, sige, na-improve mo siya ngayon kasi nagpadala ka ng workers doon. But then, how about next year? Kung tinanggal mo na yung workers mo, nandun pa rin ba sila? Or kung nag nag uh, tinanggal mo na yung funding mo, magstay pa rin ba sila doon? Kaya bang sustain nung local economy mo yung mga healthcare workers na magstay doon para mabayaran naman yung oras nung healthcare professional uh, to the, through private sector, even the government? Uh, if I may comment doon sa supply ng healthcare workers na sa LGUs na sinasabi na hindi sila maka-hire, uh, based doon sa mga ilang interviews namin with um, LGU executives, what we found was that hindi sa ayaw nila. Uh, gusto nila, wala lang talaga nag apply sa uh, At pangalawa, yung tungkol sa Magna Carta, yung issue ng Magna Carta is not just uh, particular sa health sector. Kumbaga, kung nahihirapan sila magpasweldo sa doktor, nahihirapan din sila magpasweldo sa iba pa nilang mga, uh, sa mga, mga LGU workers. Uh, Nas nandun pa rin yung issue ng uh, ESCAP, uh, personal, personal Services Cap, na Kasi ganito lang yung kita ng local government natin, hanggang dito lang yung kaya natin, kaya natin bayaran ng mga personnel. At posibleng kaya natin makakuha ng doktor, pero hindi tayo makakuha ng engineer. So meron mga ganung trade-off sa local government. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, okay, our next question is from Ms. Mary Grace uh, Darumday of the Department of Budget and Management. Mary Grace, please. Hello, Mary Grace, are you there? Okay, we can call Mary Grace later. Uh, let's go to the question of uh, Mr. Merwin Salazar. Is this Merwin Salazar of the CEPO? Senate Economic and Planning Office? Hello? Merwin, Merwin are you there? Okay, let me just read the, the question of Merwin. Um, on your policy implication one, the fact is increasing incomes among households, especially in rural areas, could be difficult because of the rate at which local economy is developing. Merwin, are you there? Hello? Yes, I'm here. yes, yes. Yeah. Go ahead with your question, Merwin. Yeah, I think Michael has touched on uh, answering my question earlier. Um, but I'd like to, yeah, I think the, the local economy is really important because health professionals has to earn, have to earn in, in, in the place, in the areas where they are uh, working in. But the, the problem is, uh, the fact is, in the Philippines, most of our um, uh, provinces' um, um, incomes of households could not increase that much because at the rate at which local economies are uh, moving. So um, my question is, what do you think should the government do? Well, well there is a deployment program, but you know, the, the, uh, the assignment of, of the, the motivation for, for health workers to work in provinces is also uh, influenced by, you know, our national policies, health policies, there is, health is a devolved service. In, it's, it's a devolved uh, service. So um, um, I haven't seen in your presentation the number of, of health workers working in the public uh, health facilities and those who are working in the private faci facilities. I think that would, I think, inform us as to whether or not uh, government policies are working uh, with regard to, for example, enticing them into working in the pub, in the government hospitals or health centers, or maybe they are in the rural areas, but they are in the or in the they are in the provinces, but they are in the private uh, health facilities. So I, I think I'd like to see that also. Thank you, Mike. Please. Uh, thank you for your comments, Sir Merwin. Uh, that is a valid, uh, I guess, uh, point. Na we want to see yung public-private na distribution. And 
Kaya namin siya hindi sinama dito because one, the data is, we cannot disaggregate. But they, in other studies, well, at least for sa mga numbers ng DOH, many of the numbers that they are reporting are based on uh, public sector figures kasi yun yung readily available uh, from, their, from their database. Um, so in this sense, yung pinakita namin in, in this presentation is a much broader set. And, but, but I agree, yung public-private uh, distribution would be important, especially now with the increased uh, salaries of government personnel, it's possible, especially for, for those who are entry-level uh, positions, na, ano ba, ma, uh, na pumunta sa government instead of private sector, which would be a loss to society. Uh, uh, about yung pagpunta, when, when we mentioned about increasing incomes among households, we were thinking more long term. So, uh, in the shorter term, uh, I guess there's no other way but to augment yung, yung supply through government uh, through, through government uh, programs like the Dr. Sudabaris program. But then uh, we also need to think about the longer uh, term implications of these programs. Are we breeding uh, dependence the national government, which we don't like to see under the uh, local government code. Uh, whether um, the corollary in the question is, are we better off without with uh, without the centralization? And based on our data, there uh, is a disparity in the 1990s. We don't know if it will continue with or without the, without the centralization. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, sir. Sheila, we can hear you. Sorry for that. Let me go back to Miss Mary Grace Derundai of the DBM. Mary Grace? Hello, can you hear me? Hello, Mary Grace? Okay. Let me just read the... Um, the uh, question of Mary Grace. Well, she's from the Department of Budget and Management. On compensation of health workers, there is a disparity in salaries and benefits of those who are hired by the national government versus those who were hired by the LGUs. This is due to the source of funds since LGUs got theirs from their ERA or their internal revenue allotment. Do you have any suggestions on how we can on how we in the government can address this. Mike? Um, sige. Mahirap din naman na tanong ito eh. <laughs> well, um, so, I agree na there could be disparities uh, between the national and, gover and local government higher. But if I remember correctly, there is this, I'm not sure if it's a law or a memorandum, or this, there was this issue once that, that states that um, healthcare professionals in the public sector will be paid a uh, national rate. Tapos, syempre, subject to funds, ganyan-ganyan. And, syempre, yung ibang gobyerno, ibang local governments cannot finance this uh, this rate. Uh, kasi ito yung narinig natin when we go to the field. Uh, pero, hindi lang naman yun yung uh, issue. Some of, yung mga iba rin natin narinig na issue is that uh, there is some politics then, because uh, for some um, LGUs, especially for the poorer ones, pag binigay nila yung national rate dun sa mga sa mga physicians, for example, uh, pwedeng mas mataas yung susweldo hen no no physician, rural health physician, compared sa mayor. So meron ding isang ganong politics. So a question: Do you have any suggestions on how can we in the government address this? Well. And I guess there's some sense to this. It's to nationalize, yung re-nationalize the health sector. But we need to keep in mind na paano ba siya is centralized ulit. Uh, like, for, like now in the Universal Health Care Act, there's some sort of ano ba, recentralization of health care services from the LGUs. Now you have this uh, provincial health board and the provincial health systems and somehow you can work around that, um, around that space. 
And uh, one beauty of this is that uh, related to another study that we did, the um, issue with decentralized so because uh, there is beauty to decentralization. So, mas, mas maalam yung mga local government units natin about their constituents at kung ano yung mga finances nila doon or other resources. So, alam nila kung sino yung i-hire nila. And pwedeng hindi alam ng national government yun. But from another study that 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 we did, we found that yung benefits ng health or yung services uh, in the health sector cannot is not confined um, in the LGU, for instance, municipio. Pwedeng meron spillover siya sa kapitbahay. Uh, hospital ako dito sa municipio ko, kaya yung mga tiga kapit uh, municipio sa akin pumunta. At is unf- or sa health facility yamang kami and and that is resources na sana decentralized talaga siya sa sa mga constituents ko lang so there is a space na magre-centralize and somehow baka pwedeng mapasok doon na kung mas re-centralize yung ating health sector uh pwedeng mas uniform yung ating mga pasahon uh, that, that's one idea although of course there are other ideas another idea is that kung talagang sa tingin ng gobyerno uh, there is benefit in having this uh, ano ba? Uh, benefits for the for the for the healthcare workers. But in the, if we as a nation think of it as a public good, then we should pay for it through taxes and then transfer to local government. Or pwede rin na command and control. Na talaga kailangan yung bayaran to meron tayong batas. That's another way. Thank you. Actually, sa, in our next webinar, uh, Thursday next week, ano, we will have a discussion on health devolution. And uh, one of the things that our presenter will discuss in, is on the um, uh, sources of financing which our LGUs can tap in order to uh, provide better health services um, in the localities. So watch out for that, for that uh, webinar of, of PIDS next week. Okay, so... Okay, other questions? Um, okay, Dr. Alfredi Pas- Alfredo Pascual, uh, one of our uh, Board of Trustees uh, members has a question. I, Dr. Pascual, are you there? Okay, let me check if he is still in the... Oh, it seems that he already left. So let's go back to the next one. Okay. Dr. Jaime Almora, uh, who earlier shared his comment, has a question. Dr. Almora, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, this is more of a, com- a suggestion rather than a question. Uh, we do need some uh, data, and we would be happy if you would expand your data collection in the context of the universal healthcare law. Because the universal healthcare law uh, will, uh, to a large extent, shift our practice in the healthcare delivery system from the hospital-centered care to a primary care-centered care. So uh, it is provided in the law that uh, patients, all patients, should pass through the primary care physician or the primary care center before they can go to a specialist. The primary care physicians are mostly the generally the generalist. So uh, we would appreciate if uh, you can expand your study for us to know how many generalists are there, so that we know if the prim- if the requirement of the law, which is the implementation of the uh, outpatient package to the primary care uh, clinics can be implemented within two years' time, because that is a requirement of law. And uh, also, secondly, there seemed to be a big irony among the healthcare providers, especially the nurses who went into the police and the military. Uh, it would be very interesting to find out uh, what really motivates them to go. Is it, re- is it, just the, is it really just the salary or something else? Because the training of a healthcare professional is really to save lives and at all costs to save lives. But if you are in the military, if you're in the police, if the situation so demands that you have to kill, then you have to kill. 
So, <laughs> is there uh, is this a factor? I would say the the, the, person, the personality. So we would like oh, that from there we can possibly uh, uh, we can possibly infer if uh, our nurses are going there just for the salary or are the is the personality personality <laughs> related. Uh, it would be interesting to know that uh, because uh, it's not only the geographical distribution of our healthcare provider, but more so on the uh, uh, where they are working in the non-medical or non-healthcare field. Where are they in the non-healthcare fields? Uh, that would be interesting. So if you can expand that, uh, that would be very interesting and it would be very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. That is, uh, uh, those points are well taken. Uh, if I may comment back about um, generalist and specialist, supply of generalist and specialist. Uh, sir, pag lumabas yung PSA na census for this year, uh, they sure would have those figures. Uh, but off the bat, um, we've, we are helping uh, DOH um, with some estimates to project yung supply of healthcare workers based on board uh, on the number of board passers. And uh, we have those estimates up to 2030 or 2040. So uh, they are planning to include it in their um, health human resource uh, plan or something. So lalabas daw sir nila this year. Um, about uh, what, uh, ano ba ginagawa ng mga health human, mga trained natin na health human resource if they are not in the healthcare professionals and sila. Uh, that is one observation na nakita natin uh, when we're doing projections for the Department of Health. But because we were comparing uh, ilan ba yung stock, ilan yung nag-register na valid na PRC licenses for for the years that I presented. And what we found out was that mas marami yung licenses na, licenses na available doon sa actual na nagsabi na ito yung trabaho ko. So interesting nga, sir, na malaman kung nasan sila. Kung wala sila sa health profession, nasan sila usually. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Michael. Um... Let me just check if we have other questions. I think we have questions from our Facebook uh, followers. Okay, there is a comment from the uh, director Anna of the DILG. Those use would like to provide national level pay. They are limited by the personnel services cap imposed under the local government code of 1991 okay okay i i think we have um we have no more questions left uh to our comments from our facebook viewers so at this point um please join me in um thanking our uh, speaker for his enlightening and uh, comprehensive presentation. Please join me in giving him a virtual clap. Okay, and thank you very much to all of you for your um, active participation in our open open forum. Okay, well, just to, to wrap up, uh, we hope that the, our discussion today has given you a clear picture of the situation confronting our health workers and of course the important role that uh, proactive policies and programs informed by data and evidence uh, play to address the needs of our health workers. So um, as um, mentioned by our uh, by some of our participants there is the need for that uh, close and active collaboration among relevant government agencies our local government units and our professional associations as well not in order for us to um, um, address the challenges being faced by our health workers and um, we have we have uh, some of recently enacted uh, legislations that um okay 
that uh, hopefully will will spur economic um, development in the countryside and and hopefully will attract more health workers to all work in uh, remote areas of the country. Okay. So at this point, I'd like to uh, call uh, our president. Dr. Celia Reyes for her closing remarks. Mamsel? Yeah, thank you, Sheila. I, I just want to thank everybody for um, um, joining our webinars. It's now a weekly um, event. And uh, of course, this has been made possible by our team, Sheila, Wang, and Gwen, and JM, um, who yeah. allows us to connect with all of you even during this time of community quarantine. So thank you very much. And please visit our website um, to get information about our weekly webinar series. And thank you to, um, to Mike, Dr. Mike Abrigo for sharing the results of his study today. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much, Mamsel. Before we close, some uh, reminders to all of you. Um, well, uh, the the PowerPoint presentation of uh, Dr. Michael Abrigo may be accessed from our website. Uh, flash on your screen is the link, but uh, don't worry if, if you missed it, we will send you the, the link. Um, we will email you uh, the link after our uh, webinar. Also, a uh, gentle reminder about um, um, answering our survey. We will we would like to um, improve our webinars and so your your comments and your suggestions are very important to us we will also send you an email regarding the feedback survey okay and lastly uh please always follow us on our social media pages we have a website where you can find all our publications as well as schedule of our events and we also have a facebook page and a, a twitter account so this ends our webinar for this week. Uh, again, thank you very much for your 